Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Maida. I'm one of the third year urology residents at um, the Department of Urology at the University of Florida in Gainesville. This is my grand rounds presentation titled uh, Penile Enhancement Surgery Overview and Techniques. Disclosures, I have none. Learning objectives. So uh, today I'd like to briefly discuss the background and history of penile enhancement. We'll talk a little bit about the patient population and their characteristics. Uh, briefly review whatever guidelines are available and there's not much. Uh, and then discuss the various techniques that have been described and performed for penile enhancement. And I'll be emphasizing uh, suspensory ligament division and, and penuma, um, just because there's not enough time to go into detail on all the different techniques. So penile enhancement is not a new concept. Uh, this has been for centuries or thousands of years um, something that people have been fascinated with. The saddest holy men of India and, and males of the Kolomak tribe in Peru used to use weights to increase their penile lengths. The males of the Dayak tribe in Borneo used to mutilate their penises by forming holes and placing decorative items in them for their patients, uh, for their uh, partner's pleasure, <laughs> not patients. Um, to the right here, this is one of these piercings um, that, can be, uh, that can be seen. Uh, in the 16th century, men of the Topanama tribe of Brazil allowed poisonous snakes, actually, to bite their penises in order to enlarge them. And the injection of exogenous substances uh, into the genital skin is still something that um, is widely seen to this day. Um, in regards to guidelines, there really is no guideline. Um, so the AUA basically states that nothing has been shown to be safe or efficacious. They specifically mention subcutaneous fat injection for increased girth. And then they also mention suspensory ligament uh, division for increasing penile length. This is really all, all I could find guidelines wise. So uh, no surprise to any of us, there's very little evidence. Um, very few urologists even perform these surgeries. It's rarely indicated and considered an elective aesthetic surgery. Most of the published literature is just a single surgeon uh, presenting a series of cases that they performed. Uh, and very few of these studies are well-designed and definitely not comprehensive. The indications are poorly defined and really there's no clear outcome measure for success, at least that I've seen. And the only consensus that I could really find for these procedures was um, correction of micropenis which is an extremely, extremely small percentage of the patients that are presenting asking for these surgeries, of course. So first I'd like to talk a little bit about who is trying to get these uh, procedures done. So this is a study out of Italy uh, where they looked at patients that presented or referred uh, for short <laughs> penis and requesting surgical correction. So it was a two year period of patients presenting they looked at 67 patients, median age of 27. First, they obtained a thorough clinical history, a SHIM score, and a thorough physical examination, including a penile length and circumference in both the flaccid and fully stretched states. And then uh, also asked the patients to estimate the length of uh, a normal sized penis. In a previous study that they published, they developed this nomogram for the normal penile length uh, with different percentiles. And that's what you can see at the bottom here. Uh, in, the, in that study, they looked at 3,300 uh, men and that's how they came to this um, conclusion. And basically the 50th percentile they determined to be 12.5 centimeters, which is just uh, right about five inches would be the 50th percentile. And looking at a bunch of other studies. Uh, these are some of the older studies. As you can see, this has been going on since 1899. Uh, people have been trying to figure this out. Uh, what I've seen mostly is that 12.5 centimeter number tends to be where most of the studies fall. Um, some of the larger numbers tend to be in really small studies. So the 3300 is by far the biggest one that I found. Uh, results, 66% uh, of patients complained of a short penis only when flaccid and 33% while both flaccid and erect. And surprisingly, there was only one patient that was worried only about the erect length uh, of his penis. 
22% complained about their circumference and 85% thought that they could estimate what a normal penile length is. And they thought that the range should be from 10 to 17 centimeters. 15% um, just said that they were unable to estimate what a normal penis uh, size was. And importantly, none of these 67 patients were under the 2.5 uh, percentile based on that nomogram. This I also found interesting. 63% uh, of the patients recalled the problem starting in childhood when they thought that their penis was smaller than their friends. And then 37%, it started in their teenage years after seeing erotic images, but none of these patients developed this perception later in life. So most men who are seeking these surgeries tend to overestimate what normal penile length is. And none of the patients in the study could be classified as having a severely short penis, at least based on the nomogram that they uh, mentioned. Uh, this was really important. So when they talked to the patients about the nomogram and where they lie compared to other men in regards to normal penile length, 70% of these patients were reassured and no longer interested in pursuing intervention. Uh, so good counseling is key. The first thing I'll talk about is suspensory ligament release. And just briefly about suspensory ligament, you see in the, the picture to the right there, it adheres the pubic symphysis to the tunica albigenea of the corpora cavernosa, and it has a couple functions. One function is to hold the penis close to the pubic bone, and this allows it to stabilize the penis and keep it at an angle that's optimal for vaginal intercourse. So you can imagine if you release this ligament, that angle no longer exists. Uh, another function uh, is also it covers the neurovascular bundle of the penis anteriorly, so there's some degree of protection uh, to those nerves from this ligament. So I did find um, a study that was out of the UK uh, that I'd like to go into a little more detail on. Uh, like I said, there's very little evidence in general, so where I did find evidence, I'd like to present some of it. Um, this is a retrospective review uh, looking at 42 patients with various etiologies for why they underwent this surgery. Uh, the top right uh, chart there shows that 64% of the patients presented with penile dysmorphic disorder. So that's really important to think about. It's not a, an anatomical or physical problem that's led to them doing the surgery. The mean age was 39. And then uh, their outcomes uh, were the objective increase in stretch penile length and subjectively the rates of patient satisfaction. In regards to the surgery they did, all of these patients did get the suspensory ligament division, but these are often accompanied with other procedures such as insertion of a silicone buffer or a VY plasty closure, or in, in some obese patients, also suprapubic fat pad excision. <laughs> So briefly, the surgical technique for uh, a, lot, a lot of the people on the call here are surgeons, so this may be of interest. So they approached via a transverse or inverted V suprapubic incision, and while the penis was on stretch, they divided the ligament close to the pubic bone until all those attachments were freed. In some of the patients, a silicone buffer, which was actually just a small testicular prosthesis, was placed in that space that's created by releasing the ligament, and then anchored to the base of the pubis with an ethabon suture. And the thought behind this is that it'll prevent reattachment um, of that or, or scarring down of that area. In some of the obese patients, like I mentioned, an excision of the suprapubic fat pad was performed. And then the original incision in most cases was closed as an inverted VY plasty, which I'll show you a picture of it in case you're not familiar with it. Uh, and then after the wound healed, this was really important. Uh, the patients were supposed to perform these uh, physical therapy exercises with either penile weights or, or VEDs or the use of a penile stretching device. So VY plasty, basically you get this inverted V incision and then after you release the suspensory ligament, everything comes forward, which allows you to close it in this Y configuration that sort of brings everything forward and that, that's where the inverted VY comes from. Um, so results, the big thing I'd like to point out is the satisfaction rate is actually very low. Um, 35% satisfaction rate, specifically, uh, this red box over here 
I, I'd like to point you to the penile dysmorphic disorder patients had an even lower, so 27%, not surprising, satisfaction rate. But although the N is low, the penile carcinoma and trauma patients had 100% satisfaction rate uh, following the surgery. So the etiology does seem to make a difference in patient satisfaction. Um, uh, I, already, I already briefly mentioned the satisfaction rate. Uh, in regards to increase in stretch penile length, they reported an approximately 1.3 centimeter increase with a very wide range. Uh, and then really the only patients that they saw a statistically significant increase was the ones that had both the suspensory ligament division and the silicone spacer placed. And even then it was only about one centimeter. And like I said, it, it didn't really even uh, correlate to patient satisfaction. They mentioned a very low complication rate, which almost every study for every surgery I looked at seemed to have mentioned a low complication rate, uh, despite other studies uh, showing uh, the number of patients that present with complications down the line. But they only had four patients with wound infection and one with wound breakdown. So uh, in conclusion, these penile suspensory ligament releases and other augmentation techniques may very, uh, very minimally increase the penile length, but not to agree that satisfies the patients. And then the men specifically with penile dysmorphic disorder, so 65% of the people in this study have unrealistic expectations and should be encouraged first to seek psychological help with surgery reserved as a last resort. Okay, now penuma. Um, this is one of the newer um, uh, procedures that has been discussed. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of this yet, but it's becoming more popular and I suspect uh, we'll be seeing it a lot more. Uh, this is a silicone sleeve implant that's inserted subdermally on the shaft of the penis. Of course, this is an out-of-pocket procedure that's very expensive. So it costs the patient between 16 and $18,000. And there's various implant specifications in regards to length and thickness. There's a great video of the five minute video of the surgery that I'd like to show, but uh, I'll see how, how the talk goes and how much time I have at the end and maybe we'll show that. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll just briefly show a few pictures of the steps here. So first they, they perform that uh, suprapubic incision horizontally. horizontally. Um, oh. Then they dissect down and dissect the entire length of the penis as distally as they can and fully invert the penis out of that incision. And then um, the implant is fixated with a mesh. Um, what you're seeing in C is the very distal end, so the corona uh, of the penis, that's where they're fixating it. And then uh, after the implant is laid on, then it's pushed back um, uh, into the normal state, so no longer inverted. And then whatever extra length there is proximally, uh, they'll trim that and then uh, put an antibiotic solution over the entire thing at the end. So the data is very biased. So this study is by the actual inventor of the, um, of, uh, the prosthesis. So this is Dr. Elist, and he did this on 526 patients between 2009 and 2014. Only 400 of those patients consented to be in this study. Uh, so they mentioned they measured penile cir circumference uh, before and after the surgery and 30 to 90 days after the implant. And then there was this uh, survey that they used basically consisting of four questions. I have an extra slide that I can show you guys at the end if anyone's interested of the questions themselves. They also looked at self-confidence, self-esteem and satisfaction scores. And then in 77% of patients, they were allowed to, or they were able to look at the scores two to six years post-operatively. So he uh, saw an increase in mid-shaft circumference from 8.5 to 13.4 centimeters, which was a 56% increase, and saw a two-category improvement in self-confidence -conf and self-esteem in 83% uh, of the patients. And this was six to eight weeks post-operatively. And then uh, when you look at the longer term follow-up, 72% uh, patients remain, uh, 72 of patients remained improved. Uh, the most frequently seen 
complications and at a fairly low rate was seroma, scar formation and infection, all less than 5% of the patients. And then uh, they stated that none of the patients had any changes in sexual function, erections or ejaculation. 3% experienced adverse events requiring device removal. The strengths are really that there was a lot of patients, uh, but the limitations are the big part of this study, which is it's a single surgeon, the inventor of the device. Uh, 126 of the patients didn't consent to be in the study, so that could severely infect the, uh, affect the complication rate or the validation of the survey. So in January of this year, they released an update. Uh, and in this update, they discuss a new scrotal implantation technique, uh, which they say has less visible scarring, shorter operative time, less swelling and lower rates of seroma. And they also presented a multi-center retrospective study um, that included 234 patients in 2020. And this was performed by not only Dr. Elis, but the other urologists mentioned below in various uh, larger cities such as uh, Beverly Hills, Phoenix, Chicago, DC, New York, and Miami. And of the 234 patients, they were only able to get surveys from 100 of them. And this was on average 12 months post-op with a range of six to 17 months. And what they saw was similar satisfaction rates to what Dr. Elis originally uh, presented, which if you look at between high or between medium to very high, that was the vast majority of the patients. 90% still had their implant in place at the time of the study. And then um, in regards to patients that had their implant removed, uh, you can see on the bottom right there, the uh, percentage of patients for different reasons. So that's it for the Panuma for now. Um, injectable materials. This is something that maybe more people have heard of or have seen maybe patients presenting with consequences of. Um, there's a lot of different materials that have been used over the years. I didn't realize there was as many as I found, but autologous fat grafting was one of the ones that I read the most about. And basically this is performing liposuction of the abdominal fat and then taking that fat and injecting it in different spots throughout the penis to increase girth. When they used a small amount, there was a minimal increase in size. When they used a large amount, there was more complications, more nodular formation. And really what's happening is you take all these adipocytes and they have no blood supply and the vast majority of them will rupture or be reabsorbed. And then you get minimal amount of fat cells that are intact. So you have widely unpredictable outcomes. Um, it tends to be irregularly shaped or nodules are formed. And it's very hard to get a consistent result with this technique. Other things that have been used are liquid silicone, hyaluronic acid gel um, has been used and is still being used uh, quite commonly, I recently found out. Um, it was used in a while ago in glands penis augmentation, and I'll show you a picture of that here on the next slide. But it's also currently being used basically as a filler by plastic surgeons um, throughout the country and several in Florida actually, where um, it, it's the same thing that, that they're using for fillers in the face, but then now, they've been, now they're using it in the penis and it's a very lucrative, from what I hear, um, procedure that they're performing. Uh, polyacrylamide and mineral oil has also been used and it sounds like it has had mostly devastating consequences. Um, so, on this slide here, this is the glance penis augmentation with hyaluronic acid. And this just kind of shows the different spots that they injected and how they're doing it. Not too much to this slide. I won't spend too much time on it. Uh, complications. So I, all sorts of things have been seen. Foreign body reaction, swelling, uh, distortion of the penis, granulomas um, forming at various times postoperatively down the line damage to nerves and blood vessels, um, either immediately or down the line, which have led to erectile dysfunction, loss of sensation. Depending on the material used, it can drift or migrate to different parts of the body, causing major problems as well. And then in some patients, such a large volume was injected that the softness 
of the uh, implant overcame the rigidity of the penis not allowing for intercourse. So this was a study that basically just looked at five patients that presented with complications to their practice uh, from the silicone injections. So here's a penile granuloma on the left, and then a chronic inflammatory reaction post-liquid silicone injection uh, that they obviously had to take to the operating room um, for debridement and uh, reconstruction. So a very quick Google search will take you to a number of people performing these male enhancement procedures. This one is called the magic shot. Uh, as far as I have read, this is like the hyaluronic acid injection. And this is only one of many. And most of them are being done by plastic surgeons, when in my opinion, you know, if these are gonna be done, ideally they'd be done by urologists uh, since most of these people that have complications are presenting to urologists anyways. Um, so that's just an example of how easy it is for these patients to find somebody that performs these procedures. Okay, graft procedures. Um, so a lot of different grafts have been attempted over time. Dermal fat grafts, as opposed to just the liposuction and injection of fat cells, it's slightly different. So this is a, a whole graft that's harvested from the abdomen or the gluteal folds and placed circumferentially between the dartos and the buck's fascia. It tends to provide more girth than the fat injections, but also a very high complication rate. So a lot of this fat turns into fibrotic tissue. And similarly with the injections, you get penile asymmetry. Not only can you have complications at the site of um, uh, placement of the graft, but also the donor site as well. And these grafts sometimes will have venous congestion and persistent edema, and they're very long and tedious surgeries. So there has also been attempted to use allografts, um, alloderm, which is commonly used for other procedures as well. So a lot of us have heard of it. It's an acellular inert dermal matrix. It's derived from donated human skin tissue. And they think that it has the potential to provide a more consistent cosmetic result um, with respect to the symmetry and durability. And since you're not harvesting this from anywhere, there's no donor site scarring. And then this was one of the most interesting things that I came across, honestly, throughout this entire uh, process. Venus grafts or cor corpoplastic augmentation surgery where basically an incision is performed throughout the entire length of um, both corpora uh, through the tunica. And then segments of the saphenous vein are used to uh, graft onto that corpora to increase the size of the corpora. And their thought is that the advantage is having a lower incidence of fibrosis since the endothelial linings of the vein and the corpora are compatible. And um, the technique results in increased penile girth, obviously only during the erect state, only when blood um, fills the, the corporal bodies. Uh, so I only saw one series that did this and reportedly they had no complications. And here, I'll, I'll read this to you. So none of the 39 men underwent, who underwent this procedure had any post-operative complications and all reported they were satisfied with the cosmetic outcome. So like I said, a lot of these are very biased. There was one surgeon performing this and that same surgeon presenting the data. So it, it, it hasn't been replicated yet from what I've seen. And then some of the more invasive techniques will be one of the last things I discuss here. So the geometrical technique might be one of the few that you know, most of us are familiar with. And this is typically used in Peyronie's disease. So it's a single relaxing incision uh, on the side of the curvature where the plaque is that allows the penis to straighten by restoring the short side to the same side as the long side. Um, so that's kind of the most basic. And then the circular technique takes it one step further. And that extends the transverse incision around the tunica until both sides of the penis um, were straightened and enlarged to the limit of the mobilized urethra. So they fully mobilized the urethra and then performed this and then graft afterwards. The sliding technique is one of the most invasive things that I've seen. Um, basically, an extensive neurovascular bundle and urethral dissection is performed to give as much possible 
maximal length uh, that you can. And then both a ventral and a dorsal incision are made in the tunica. Then a penile prosthesis, so a penile prosthesis is required for this to really be successful. So a penile prosthesis is then placed um, to maximize the length of uh, the penis. And then you have to patch graft both the dorsal and the ventral side of the penis. Very complicated procedure, very tedious. And as you can imagine, there are so many different parts that could cause complications, whether it be devascularization, breakdown from all the different suture lines, issues with the graft. And then the most um, uh, devastating thing that we see is gland ischemia leading to necrosis of the penis. And there have been some devastating consequences that have been seen uh, by this. It's, as far as I know, it's very rarely performed now. I, I don't know if anyone is still performing it, uh, the, at least not publishing anything about it that I, that I found. And then uh, this was one of the more recent um, techniques that I saw. It's called the tunica expansion procedure. And this procedure is done basically to avoid having using, have to use a graft. And they make multiple small staggered cuts in the tunica in this meshed pattern. And then when they place the prosthesis and stretch the penis, you get these kind of diamond shaped um, formations that look like a graft um, in the penis. And then, so of course this requires prosthesis placement and the surgeon that's performing this states that no mesh is required because the slits are so small that uh, they rapidly heal. And um, he, like everyone else that I've seen uh, present their studies, say that they, they've had very good results from this. Um, his typical operative time was 1.5 hours for malleables and two hours for IPPs. And the penile gain was 3.3 centimeters um, on average in the patients uh, that he saw. And then he also performed a glans pexy uh, for stabilization of the cylinder tips in 93% of the patients. Really the only complications that he reported where 4% of patients had temporary gland numbness and then anorgasmia in 7% of the patients, then he states that both of these conditions were resolved within six months. So like some of the other ones, uh, I mean, very favorable results, at least from what the surgeons that are publishing these case series are reporting. So that, that's kind of everything that I was hoping to discuss. Um, a lot of different techniques. I obviously couldn't go into depth in every single one of them, but a lot of things exist. Some of them are still being performed. Um, so in conclusion, the desire for penile enhancement, whether it's the length or the girth or the appearance, whatever it may be, has been around for centuries and it still exists and it's not going anywhere. Um, as of now, there's no AUI, AUA guideline recommendations. Like I said, we don't have the data really to provide guideline recommendations at this time until more studies are performed. Several different techniques were attempted and still being performed. The evidence is poor and consists mostly of a very biased single surgeon series, and several of them have not been replicated. Various serious complications have been reported uh, related to these procedures, although most of the studies that I've seen have shown favorable outcomes and low complication rates. So either people are not accurately performing them or they're just happening way down the line after the, the studies have completed. Urologists, regardless if you're doing these surgeries, you have to be aware that they exist because you're gonna have patients, one, that come in asking about them or two, come in with consequences of having them. So it's important to understand um, how they're performed. Uh, Penuma, like I said, is a rapidly growing technique I, I think they're planning to present some more data this year. Um, so we'll see what that data shows and it's gonna to continue to be more popular as far as I'm, uh, I'm seeing. Many enhancement procedures are being performed by plastic surgeons, like I said, and this is happening throughout America and, and throughout the world, I think. Um, so something that we should be aware of. And that's it, I'll leave that open for questions.
Hey, Mikey. Hey, Mikey I, go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Sue. Go ahead. I, I was just saying, you know, you know, fantastic talk. It's, um, you know, a couple of comments. It is a bit amazing what people will do and what extent they will go to uh, to prove that appearance. But, um, you know, I, I think that what's interesting is I imagine Larry would agree in the era of, which I think this will become more and more relevant uh, to uh, modern urology practice. Um, one thing I did want to ask you about is the pneuma, and maybe we do have some time for you to show that. I didn't quite understand how that achieves the desired result. Um, you yeah. know, it almost seems like a somewhat of a prosthesis in a way, uh, and I'm not sure if this is a, a malleable type, of, not, not malleable, but is it uh, flexible in the detimus state, or is it constantly keeping things on the stretch? Uh, do you have... Do, do folks have interest to look at that video? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Seuss. So it, it basically increases the flaccid length and girth of the penis. It, it's not meant to increase the erect. Um, so I have this at 1.25 speed here. Uh, it should take about five minutes. So the, here are the steps of the procedure. Okay, we're injecting zonotide and marking at the base for the nerve block. Injecting at the, all the way around the base of the penis, the superpubic bone to go about inch above and make a two inch incision, transverse incision. Opening the first layer under the skin. Opening the space in the superpubic in front of the Cubic uh, bone. I open the space at the base of the penis. With two Alice clamps, the lower part of the incision is then elevated. Heat lens is used throughout the procedure to ensure the skin and urethral discharge are clean. Scissors and electrocoagulation are used for sharp dissection down to box fascia. The pocket between darters and box fascia is extended the length of the penile shaft and involves three fourth circumferential dissection. The ventral urethral area of the penile shaft is not part of the tissue dissection. Again, all points of bleeding are electrocoagulated. The penis is then diverted, and the distal dissection is extended as far as the lens. And the soft aurora tissue is released from the saltus glands. The entire length of the penile and suprapubic dissected areas later are copsly irrigated using a triple antibiotic solution mixed with refinement. This is the inner part of the implant, okay? It has a hinge, so it closes and it opens and also when the patient is on flaccid, it's like this. When you get erection, it opens like a butterfly. Okay, and then it closes here. I cover it with a Covidian mesh as a tip. Yeah. Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to embed this mesh onto as part of the implant, so there's no need to do it like this. Exactly, I put the midline of the implant at 12 o'clock and cover it. Very important to check the tip, be sure that the implant and the mesh are sitting both at the same level, okay? Time step is here as well. So I put the first suture almost at 12 o'clock. Very important, just to go here. As much as possible here at the corner. Okay. So I want to show you. It is very important. Okay. Very nicely here. I go and grab the bite from here. Okay. 
That the future are sitting nicely under the glands without coming out. Okay, so I check this skin that there is no opening, no sutures. This is the glands, corona, and urethra is here. The penis is again inverted, and the mesh is trimmed so that only one centimeter width of mesh is located on the distal portion of the implant. And is covered by the sutures. So you see, all of them are the same to synchronize. So you see the implant. So you see the implant, the midline is here. That's very important. Okay. This is the pubic bone. I'm hitting the pubic bone. His length, his length was three and a half inches on classic before surgery. And now he's six. His girth also prior to surgery was uh, three and three quarter. Now he is. Uh, Almost this one. These are the sample of uh, three. Okay, so that's the video. Uh, any other questions? Like, like, to recap, uh, there, it's mainly it's mainly for girth, but there is some a length benefit. It sounds like so flaccid length benefit. So basically, the goal is to make the flaccid penis at the length of whatever the patient's stretch penile length would be, and then increasing the girth as well. So it won't increase the erect penile length because you're not getting rid of the suspensory ligament. You're not really doing anything to add erectile length, but the flaccid length will increase and then the girth just in general will increase. Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm surprised laying that on top of the nerve vascular bundle or where it is doesn't cause a problem, but uh, it's, it's yeah. really, you know, amazing technique. It Thanks. also sounds like he's using quite a bit of cautery dorsally, which uh, I don't know, I, I, I feel like that may cause problems, but uh, it hasn't from what, a, from what he reports. Hey, Mikey, great job uh, keeping this really data-based um, is something that uh, I think a lot of people find interesting, especially from a patient perspective. You know, always patients are asking about it. Um, yeah, the penuma is really interesting. This guy, Dr. Ellis, has um, you know, been doing it since about 2015, 2018 or so in large volume. Now you got people like Steve Wilson and Paul Perito adopting it, so we're going to see more data. Um, the a lot, of, a lot of patients who end up having the penuma and are not satisfied with it are very vocal, like anything in, in prosthetic urology. And a lot of the comments about it are, well, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't feel the same way. I do have a lot of numbness. I don't have the same sensation, kind of like Dr. Sue was alluding to. And they also, I think a, a lot of patient counseling that should go in ahead of time um, may be lacking and that a lot of, a lot of folks don't understand that it's not going to change your erect penile length. It just makes you have a persistent erection pretty much. Um, and, and there's a large number of patients who have it removed afterwards, and then they go on to develop penile shortening and curvature because you know, it's unlike a you know penile prosthetic where you can straighten the penis back out, or you're not really affecting a lot of the um, uh, you know the, that corporal tunica, this penuma really scars in. So as soon as you take it out, you've already got Peroni's uh, uh, predisposition that's going to be there. So it's uh, something you're going to have to pretty much keep stay with. Mikey, um, <clears throat> nice job. Um, it seems like, you know, most of the data is very suspect, um, you know, these zero complication rates, especially like, you know, with that uh, venous grafting to say you zero complication rates, very suspect. Um, hopefully with some of these, we'll start seeing some more prospective studies, um, mm -hmm. you know, because there's a large number in that PNUMA trial where they didn't respond, which makes you wonder were they just really unsatisfied, like Dr. Campbell pointed out. Um, and you know, if you look back at some of those original studies, the suspensory ligament, the benefit really was in those who were sort of trauma or penile cancer patients. Those patients who probably have self, you know, body image issues, 
I don't think any of these are ever going to make them happy. Uh, I don't think they'll ever be happy because they have this idea in their mind and they'll never achieve it. Because, you know, even with the Numo or the Panuma, it's, you know, it, it basically makes you from a grower to a shower. Um, but it doesn't affect your erectile function, you know, as far as in a positive way, as far as making that penis bigger or whatever. So I don't think these patients are ever be satisfied. Has anyone ever looked at like therapy or a psychiatric intervention to see if those can improve patient satisfaction? So I, I, I didn't look at any specific studies that looked at the rate of satisfaction in penile length after psychotherapy. Um, but in that first study that I showed, 70% of the patients changed their mind about undergoing the procedure just by reassuring them that they were within the normal penile length. So I, I definitely think that I totally agree with what you said. We should be treating the underlying etiology in these patients. So if the underlying etiology is penile dysmorphia and we're doing some sort of physical surgery on them, that's not treating their underlying condition. So I, I'm not surprised at all by the low satisfaction rates. I totally agree with what you said. Yeah. I, will, I will look into it and see if there are any studies done specifically on psychological help increasing satisfaction and penile length. Uh, I just, I, I, I didn't see. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's analogous to people having lobotomies done for psychiatric illnesses. It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, great, great points. Thanks, Dr. O'Malley. You know, Mike, this is Bob Donald. I'll just share with you an experience that we had. So in Wisconsin, we have a very large Hmong population. And I would say it goes back about eight years, but there was a Hmong practitioner who used to tra who traveled from Baltimore, Maryland to Wisconsin. And we know this because with the help of law enforcement, this person was apprehended. But he was actually offering that, you know, I'll do a patient for free and you actually bring, if you bring two more patients to me, I'll refund your money. And so we had this large cadre of people who re received injectables for penile enhancement. Um, in that experience, we early on identified one of our urologic surgeons and one of our plastic surgeons to deal with this because the, the granuloma formation in uh, trying to surgically correct these patients was incredibly intense. And it actually got to the point where multiple patients underwent the microscopic preservation of the nerve by our plastic surgeons. Some of the granulomas actually wound up being metastatic, if you will. They would migrate down into the scrotum, they migrate down in the perineum or up onto the mons pubis. Um, and there, from therefore, they could literally rupture or ulcerate later on down the line. I would just offer our experience, I think, was pretty clear in that having a well-identified group that actually developed the experience in dealing with these patients was actually very good. Fortunately, I'm hopeful that we don't see these patients anymore, but there is some cultural um, aspects to this that we saw in a very confined population, and it rapidly spread through that population, leading to a large group. And, and Peter Langenstroer, uh, our, one of our urologists, and uh, Jim Sanger, one of our plastic surgeons, did basically all of our patients um, some of these patients wound up moving on to needing a penile prosthesis simply because of the severe Peyronie's disease and the intractability that occurred. Some of these people were wound up with a devastated penis in ascension, uh, essentially. So um, it, it is something that if we do see, it's something we may want to have an earlier um, identification of who's going to repair that and how, because it, it's not easy. Thank, thanks for bringing that up, uh, Dr. Donnell. One thing I would like to add to that is I think that the number of injectables in the near future may actually increase um, with the number of these new men's health clinics and med spas and cosmetic surgery clinics and things like that. Um, it is so lucrative for them that I don't see it you know, going away anytime soon. So a lot of these patients with the hyaluronic hyaluronic acid injections. So they'll get anywhere from five to 15 milliliters injected from what I read. And they're charging each of these patients for five milliliter vials, $2,500. And it's costing them about $150. So it's, 
So for each patient, they, they're profiting between $2,500 to $5,000 for this outpatient procedure with really no other costs. It's really just the needle. So they're making so much money on it and the growth of these med spas that I see it actually increasing in the near future. In my experience with these patients are really just being referred to complications, the unhappy patients. And honestly, when I, when I see these patients, I try to steer them back to their surgeon who placed whatever device in to begin with, because you're, you're heading down a slippery slope. You know, obviously this patient has body dysmorphic disorder. They're unhappy with the results. Um, in the few penumas I've seen, they've resulted in severe penile fibrosis, Peyronie's disease afterwards. Um, and yeah, I don't know, I, I'm not exactly sure what to do for those guys. And I honestly probably, I wouldn't operate on those patients unless they had some psychiatric eval and you know understood that um, they were probably not gonna end up with a desirable result or what they were looking for to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of the procedures where you're not implanting a device, but basically operating on the tunica. A lot of those techniques are the same type of procedures that we would do for Peyronie's repair, plaque excision or incision and grafting. Um, you, you, I caution you about considering, you know, I think you mentioned that there was one patient or whatever that's sliding corporal technique, the tunica technique. Mm -hmm. um, I considered doing one of those procedures years ago on a guy with severe Peyronie's disease and reached out to Raphael Carrion about his experience in doing such a drastic, basically circumferential incision of the tunica and then grafting in between. And I think he had an experience of one or two patients that had a very poor outcome with glands, necrosis, distally, and essentially you know, uh, devascularization of everything distal to the circumferential incision. Um, so, you know, if you're going to set out to do these types of procedures, you need to be sure to counsel the patients appropriately that, uh, you know, obviously a lot of these techniques are very experimental with low numbers and uh, they may not have the desired outcome that they're looking for. Thanks, Dr. Young. I think we have one question. Austin, you I was just going to say, I, I thought I'd seen, or correct me if I'm wrong, that one of the marketing like pushed for the Penuma is that it's reversible. Have you seen any accounts of where this has been performed and this has not been good? Yeah, so uh, the question was that some of the marketing for Penuma says that it's reversible. Um, so uh, there have been a uh, few patients that have had it removed, but I think that since this is also recent, we haven't seen a lot of the longer term outcomes of the scarring down and the Peronis and all that. And I don't know how much of that is included in their studies. So they're not really talking too much in, the, in what they publish about the longer term outcomes of patients that have it removed, more so just how many patients are having it removed. And it seems like less than 10% are having it removed, but it's only been a few years. So I think it's gonna be a little while before we see the longer term outcomes of how long these are staying in, are they causing problems down the line? And when they're removed, what ends up happening to the penis? Like Dr. Campbell was saying, I think there will be significant scarring afterwards and shortening and curvature and deformity, but I, I have, they haven't published it yet. Hey, Mikey, to, just to comment on that. Um, you know, the only real long-term data that we have that's been published on Penuma, it comes from that paper you showed by Dr. Ellis on his single series uh, and that had an average of about four years. And, and that's not all the patients, that's on average. So yeah. you know, not all the patients, if they're gonna be satisfied are gonna be coming back to him. So if someone goes somewhere else, you know, then they're probably gonna be following up locally. And, and I think that was one of the comments and critiques is that since uh, for the longest time, Ellis was the only one who was approved to do this device, everyone would come and travel and see him. And then everyone would have to follow up with their local urologist for the complications. And, and then you'd have, um, you know, people getting frustrated having to take care of it because it's not what they signed up to, to do. And so, you know, you wonder how long it's gonna be till you start seeing something like this on botched. 
Kevin, is there a way to look at like uh, adverse uh, reported outcomes in like the FDA database to see if that is a real issue? I'm not sure with the device, but that'd be really interesting. I mean, if you can do it with like Vigibase and looking at for um, different uh, medication outcomes. But with a device, I have to imagine you'd probably have something like that being tracked by either FDA or the World Health Organization. That'd be interesting to look into. It'd be very interesting to look at, yeah. Yeah. 